problem. Uh, like I, I've had to juggle 800 million interviews over the last little while, and and they never quite go off when they're supposed to go off initially. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's always the set time, and then the actual real time. We'll come and spend another a little while later. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I thought so. we could start by like just super kind of mean big. If you could give me your definition of the men's rights movement, and then a little bit of background on how you first got involved. Okay, well, the men's rights movement is essentially uh, a movement like there. Uh, if you're talking about the larger manosphere, uh, that's a whole host of uh, like a collection and a constellation of different ideas and goals. Um, the men's rights movement, in particular, is is looking for uh, primarily for legal reform. Um, so essentially, you know, equality in criminal sentencing, equality in family court, equality in uh, legislation, uh, equality in government representation. Uh, so, uh, whereas a lot of different parts of the manosphere would be looking at social um, sexism and things like that, that the men's rights movement is mainly concerned uh, with social attitudes, primarily just because they lead to things like um, not having a White House uh, commission on men and boys, despite the fact that boys seem to really be struggling right now and uh, so I mean essentially it's it's sort of for legal and political equality um, equality in in the system right the institutions so th that's what they're about and and uh, yeah so and as far as how I got into it um, I, I essentially got into it by uh, reading and uh, you know just I stumbled across it about, I don't know, five, six years ago, and uh, read some articles, and uh, and then read their citations, and their citations all seemed to check out, and, and what they were saying about things like domestic violence and stuff like that uh, seemed to be drastically different to the message that the culture is getting from things like public service ads and, <clears throat> you know, and the information on on uh, sort of online clearing houses on domestic violence and and from uh, agencies that deal with uh, you know sort of domestic violence against women battered women shelters things like that so um, and even in some cases um, seemed completely at odds with even the information the government's putting out so uh, I essentially kind of I just I just there there seemed to be a real disconnect between what regular people, ordinary people are hearing um, from author people in authority and also just generally within the culture um, and what's actually going on out there in a lot of different areas. And uh, <clears throat> being that I have sons and, you know, I have male family members that I really care about and and all of that, uh, I guess I, get, I just, it, it really interested me. Uh, not just what was going on, but trying to figure out why. Um, that that had a big deal, uh, a great deal to do with with what got me interested. And then and then after that, um, it seemed like when I put my face out there, um, which I did to stop all of the accusations from feminists that I was actually a man. Um, oh really? Did that happen? Oh yeah, no. I even had a feminist on. Uh, Reddit pull several go back through my comment history and pull out several long comments and do sort of a literary breakdown of my writing style to prove that I was actually a man. Wow. Yeah, and like sort of went line by line, you know, regarding sentence structure and word choice and things like that. And so I, I just I, I decided, you know, okay, I'm gonna actually put my face out there to, you know, put the rumors to rest. And when I did, the response, particularly from men, was just so overwhelming. You know, I had men uh, messaging me uh, saying, you know, when I watched your video, that was the first time I've cried in 20 years. Um, I had men messaging me saying, when I watched your video, uh, like, thank you so much. Uh, you made me decide not to commit suicide. Um so, I mean, like, once that started happening and I started getting this over... And, and a lot of men would message me and say, 
thank you so much um, for for the last 10 years or so. I was I was really starting to hate women, like to actually hate women. And since I started watching your videos, I don't feel that way anymore, right? Because I, I kind of have a better understanding of what's going on and why. Whereas before it just seemed like, something that was senseless and arbitrary and mean, um, you know, whatever was happening to him in his life. Um, now he, you know, it still, he still feels it's unjust, but he at least kind of sees some kind of rationale behind why things are happening the way they are. And understanding it helped him, you know, help, helps them people cope with, you know, if you have an explanation, even if it's inadequate or even if it's unjust, if it's at least an explanation and you can sort of say, okay, this is why this is happening to me, it, it helps you cope. And Do any um, specific examples come to mind of what any of these guys were going through that? Oh, th things in family court, uh, f you know, false accusations, being falsely accused of domestic violence, uh, uh, ha living with an abusive partner and having, uh, you know, like when, when feminists came up in the sixties and they did some, some very good things, um, as far as just in practical terms with, uh, domestic violence shelters for women and things like that. Um, one of the things that they really focused on was that, uh, you know, abuse is abuse and, if somebody is behaving that way toward you, um, instead of making excuses or thinking it's your fault, you should, you know, like, we're going to try and help you recognize that what's happening to you is abuse, right? Because that's the first step to getting out of the situation. And uh, a lot of men seem to be in relationships with women who were abusive, both physically and, and psychologically and sometimes sexually, and uh, and they had no word to to apply to it. They, like it wouldn't. It never occurred to them. There's nothing in the culture that would help them identify that as abuse, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, everything in the culture and in, in the sort of the the mainstream culture is telling them that well, if she's not happy, you're probably the abusive one. So. You know, I mean, th these are the kind of problems that these these men have, and uh, and there just really isn't any any help um, available to them. And a lot of them internalize the problem and blame themselves because they just don't see examples of you know this behavior is actually abuse, or you know it's starting to change a little bit, but. You know, this behavior, when she does this, she's abusing you. They never saw that within the culture. Uh, and did you hear from any women at the same time that you were getting this sort of influx of, of guys writing to you? Oh, of course. Of course, I've had women uh, right from the start uh, message me and tell me, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. Sometimes it's because they have a son or a husband who's going through something really difficult with, you know, a divorce or child custody or, or whatever. <laughs> Um, sometimes it's, um, just a woman thanking me for saying the things that she thinks she, she's always felt this way about these issues and, and she hasn't really felt like she could speak her mind about it. And she's just glad that somebody's kind of sticking up for, for men who are in trouble. And, and, you know, even though she maybe doesn't have anybody in her life that's going through that. So... Oh, I think that was um, maybe right at the end of 2010 or the beginning of 2011. Okay, and was this, so did this follow after you'd written, you mentioned the, the Reddit thread, so have, were you sort of commenting on different words beforehand and then launched your blog, or how did that work? Yeah, I, I was commenting a lot on, on Reddit in particular, but also on just general, on websites mm -hmm. and uh, other, other websites, men's issues sites. But, um, but yeah, I... I started a blog, I figured, okay, well, I'm, I'm writing all of these long comments and I'm putting so much of this time and effort into it that I might as well just stick it all in one place. And, uh, and then, yeah, it just kind of, uh, it went from there. So, um, 
And the tagline on the site is, this is what anti-feminism looks like. What is anti-feminism? Well, what is an anti-feminist? Well, I, I, there's a whole host of, of people who uh, are very different who could describe themselves as anti-feminist for very different yeah. reasons, right? Um, for me, uh, my anti-feminism is uh, it's sitting in opposition to an ideological framework that, uh, you know, uh, you, would, you might call it the feminist lens or patriarchy theory or feminist philosophy, that sort of academic... Um, pseudo-Marxist, uh, men are the bourgeoisie and women are the proletariat uh, type of thinking. Um, that uh, the dialectic, I guess you'd call it, that um, that typically gets used in in discussions in you know in universities and women's studies classes and on some blogs. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that that model adequately. Uh, describes society and and the relationship of men and women in society. I think it uh, it leaves out a lot of the picture, and I think it also frames um, certain aspects of gender relations. It sort of twists them, um, so there there really is no way you can't be sexist toward women. Um, everything is sexist toward women, and uh, so it. it I, I've even heard um, misandry or sexism against men. Um, no matter what attitudes underlie it, uh, as being being described as secondary misogyny, it's just a byproduct of misogyny. And if we did away with misogyny, then those problems would disappear for men. And I, I just don't think that's the case. I don't think that it's as as black and white as that. I don't think that of men as a monolithic perpetrator slash oppressor class and women as a monolithic victim class is, is the way to analyze uh, society and, and human interaction within it. I just, it's just not, it's not realistic. So um, I'm, I'm sort of looking at things from a little bit more of a holistic and, and there's a lot of things attached to that, that model, uh, a lot of assumptions attached to that model that uh, I, I absolutely disagree with the entire gender is 100% a social construct and uh, there's still shades of that 1960s, 1970s ethic of uh, if there was no, um, if we treated all children exactly the same, um, they would grow into bisexual uh, androgynous adults. Uh, there's, there's no evidence for that. There's plenty of evidence that that would not be what happens. Um, so, uh, and, and a lot of these sort of assumptions are, uh, are, I mean, it, it seems like wishful thinking and on an epic scale. And I, I just, so much of it is, is not realistic. It's not based in science. So. Mm -hmm. Well, when you talk about, excuse me, um, gender as social construct, is that, is that sort of part of the idea of, you know, I'm sure that I'm sure that the culture uh, actually uh, what my what what my belief is right, and I think that there's plenty of evidence for it, and and it's actually a fairly moderate belief. It's not the extreme position. Is that uh, biology contributes a very great deal right from the get go, and there's evidence of that from you know the age of one day old when they test babies for what they choose to stare at longer um you know boys tend more boys stare at a mechanical object uh for longer than they do at a face and more girls stare at a face longer than they do at a mechanical object so <clears throat> you look at you look at that uh boys acquiring language um more slowly um and all of those things and those uh differences uh play out even among girls 
um, when girls have uh, a higher than normal testosterone level at birth, um, they present all of those same patterns that boys typically do. So, and I certainly did as a kid because uh, I wasn't interested in dolls and Barbies <laughs> and things like that. I was interested in Legos and Meccano and, and all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, so, um, you know, I, I do know that uh, culture can take what's already there and push back against it um, or reinforce it and encourage it to, uh, you know, go further in the direction that it, it already wants to go. Um, but it's culture can't eliminate uh, those differences, not when they start in the first year of life before there is really any socialization going on. Um, and not when so much of it is based on hormone levels and things like that. So, um, when, when you, you kind of look at this idea that, uh, you know, okay, so the gender is a social construct model. Uh, what's the prediction that you would have made in the seventies based on that? You would have made the prediction that as a society becomes more egalitarian and women acquire more and more rights to do what they want to do in life, right? That the choices of occupation between men and women will become more similar. And what you find is that this is the opposite happens, right? So in the most egalitarian countries like Sweden and Norway and and places like that, they actually have higher levels of gender segregation in, in what you would see as stereotypically male or stereotypically fe female fields. Um, so whereas in Iran, uh, half of the people or Iraq or even, you know, Qatar or Thailand or India, right, 40% of people in, in studying STEM, right, would be women and working in STEM. Um, in a place like Sweden, it's more like 10%, right? And it's, it's the, so the, the general idea or the general consensus, uh, given those numbers, and they've looked at 53 different countries and found that this is just kind of the case across the board, the more economic and social freedom people have to do what they want to do, the more likely they are to choose gendered things. Um, the, the consensus as to why that happens is that once you remove all the barriers, right, particularly economic barriers, um, you know, in India, if you're a woman, you take tech even if you don't want to because that's what's going to get you a job, right? Um, and, and you really need a job. Right. Whereas in Sweden, there's a little bit more, you know, you can choose what you want to do. It might pay a little less than STEM, um, but it will be more fulfilling towards you to, say, be a nurse or a teacher instead. Right. So this is really the sort of the general consensus among the people who actually um, do do solid research on this kind of stuff. Um that, that the more equal the society gets, the more unequal men's and women's choices tend to be on average. And it, it's, it's really nice that when you have an equal society and you have that 10% of women that feel that they can go into STEM because it's what they really, 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 really want to do, um, you know, uh, of course that's a great thing. That's wonderful. And I, and I want to see that continue. But um, what they found in Norway uh, was that they, pour, they would have to pour... M tons of money into campaigns to recruit girls um, in high school and going into university to get them to take STEM fields, to get them to take engineering. And for the entire length of the campaign, they'd see an increase of about two to three percent. So from 10 percent to, you know, 12 percent um, of these occupations being filled by women. And then the moment they stopped pouring money into it, uh, it went back down, right? It went back down to normal. So you kind of have to ask yourself, like, is this disparity indicative of an injustice or is it simply indicative of people's preferences? Right. And if it's only indicative of people's preferences and everybody's happy with their choices and no injustice has been done, then it's not something that needs to be fixed. Any 
name um, Honey Badgers comes from and a little bit of background as well in the, the Honey Badger Brigade. Okay, well, uh, the Honey Badger started, Alice and I got to know each other uh, sort of on Reddit and through her blog and through through my blog a little bit, and we both had written articles for A Voice for Men. And uh, I was, <clears throat> when we sort of met uh, formally, um, we were sort of both participating in it. I was hosting, co-hosting a radio show for A Voice for Men uh, weekly, and Allison would sometimes come on um, Alice and Tiemann would sometimes come on as a floating co-host, so maybe every second or third week. And, uh, when that show ended because my co-host, uh, couldn't put the time into it anymore, he had to get a second job and, and that was it. Um, she and I sort of, based on the success of, of my YouTube channel and, uh, and the, I guess sort of the ability, uh, that women have to present issues like this, topics like this, and and not get seen as like dangerous or or threatening, right? Dangerous to women. Is that how men you think are perceived when they talk about this stuff? Oh yeah, you know they're either ignored, um, or or they're perceived as dangerous. So or like mocked. So essentially, any time that they're actually going to be effective, uh, men are tend they tend to be effective because there's some element there of people being a little bit intimidated or afraid or see these men as angry and uh and and so maybe we better listen to them right um so women women seem to have this uh this ability to talk about this stuff and not be seen in those ways uh not be mocked as you know whiny man babies and uh, not be ignored uh, quite as easily and not be dismissed as, you know, dangerous extremist reactionaries who, you know, want, want to make it legal to beat your wife or something like that. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so you sort of, uh, we had the situation where, you know, we knew each other and we knew there was, there was another woman that we knew from from Reddit and, and a blog called Breaking the Glasses, and we thought, you know, like, let's just take this to a a woman-run radio show talking about these issues. And again, it sort of just expanded from there. We had people join, a lot of people with um, a lot of talent, particularly artistic talent, and, uh, and so it just got bigger and branched out into different areas of cultural interest, uh, things like nerd culture and, you know, pop culture and and all of that other stuff. So, uh, now the honey badgers, they do some like four podcasts a week. I only generally do just the one, um, sometimes two, but, uh, but yeah, they're, they're putting up podcasts all the time talking about different things, comic books or, or, uh, science fiction movies or, or whatever. Right. From the, uh, from the angle of men's issues and, and, uh, a different paradigm of gender in society, so. And where does the name Honey Badgers come from? Oh, that, that was, that. that came from a video, I don't know if you've seen it, it seems like almost everybody on the planet's seen this yeah. video. Yeah, I know you're talking about the, it, the Honey Badger, yeah. Honey Badger right. don't care, Honey Badger don't give a shit. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what it came from, it was essentially, um, there was a conversation in some comment thread on some website where, uh, you know, a lot of people were applauding us for our bravery, us, us sort of female MRAs. Um, and, uh, I think it was Dr. Tara Palmatier who does a lot of counseling for men in abusive relationships. Um, she said, well, we're like the honey badger. We don't give a shit. And, uh, and so the name just kind of stuck. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting meme, um, to use. And, uh, I, part of me thinks it's kind of silly, but at the same time, you know, it's, I guess it's sort of apt and, and people like to, you know, draw funny pictures of honey badgers doing stuff. And, you know. uh, but the, the phrase or the term honey badger doesn't sort of include all all women MRAs is this like specific to the 
Penny Badger Brigade, or is that like a label that that other women use in the movement too? Oh, I think I think uh, the the initial usage of it was to imply any woman who who okay. you know kind of talked about these things, and then we just sort of took the and made yeah. made it into a brigade. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I don't like it's not a trademark or anything. It's sort of yeah, it's yeah. like Kleenex, right? You know, you, you can you pass me a Kleenex whether it's Scotty's right. or or whatever. So. And I know I read a little bit about it online, but um, I know something just happened at the Calgary Comics Expo. Is that right? Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about what sort of what went down and? Oh, well, okay, so essentially we had a couple of things up in our booth. Uh, the booth was mostly devoted to Allison's uh, graphic novel series. Um, which she's been working on for seven years. And uh, but we had some, uh, stuff there uh, that was honey badger related uh, for sale and we also had some stuff there that um, was Gamergate related and uh, I guess when people saw the Gamergate logo on our stand against censorship poster um, they they got really really upset and there was sort of a flurry of angry tweets on social media angry comments directed at the expo for hosting a Gamergate booth. And uh, so, you know, like the Thursday, it was a four-hour day, and uh, we were there for the full four hours. And Allison, at one point, she went to attend, uh, as a woman in comics, she went to attend uh, a panel discussion called Women Into Comics. And... uh, the subject of MRAs was brought up by the panelists, uh, sort of in this confused, like, I don't know what these MRAs are thinking. Does anybody know what these MRAs are thinking? You know? And so she stood up and she asked if she could field the question. And they said, sure. And then she identified herself, you know, she said, because I am an MRA. And, uh, and they said, okay, go ahead. And, and so she, uh, she essentially, uh, made the most benign, statement uh, one could possibly make, most polite statement of disagreement with feminism that you would ever find, right? Just just a very, very polite, calm expression of, you know, why, why, this is why I don't like feminism. Well, do you remember what it was? What was it? Uh, I can almost do it word for word. She said, the reason I don't like feminism is because you promote the idea that women are victims. And if you look at the context of all of your issues, you'll find that men suffer considerable problems too. And they need to be brought into the story, not just for the sake of men, because this hides men's vulnerabilities, but also for the sake of challenging the notion that women are defined as victims. And then they had a little bit of a back and forth um, just a very polite back and forth. The recording's up online. And, uh, and at one point, I think Allison said, well, you know, when, when I decided, you know, how I felt about men and women, when I decided, you know, that I wanted to be a, a, um, that I wanted to see a change, I decided to create the change, the comic that I wanted to read. I decided to be the change I wanted to see, right? And that this, in her opinion, is, is a more useful um, way to, to go about things than coming in and being hypercritical and sort of getting on the case of nerds for, you know, the things you like are sexist and racist and nasty and that makes you a bad person, um, which, which seems to be, even if it's not the message feminists want to send, to a lot of nerds, it's the message that those nerds are internalizing and, you know, that they seem to be receiving some kind of personal judgment on them. And, um, and so essentially, uh, when we went home that night, I mean, Allison walked away thinking that they'd had a productive conversation. And when, when we went home, uh, that night, 
she, you know, we noticed that the Mary Sue had an article up about that, about how she disrupted the panel and derailed the discussion. It was very rude and all of this, right? And, uh, and that not only that, but we had, uh, we had, we were attending the convention under false pretenses, lied about who we are and, and, uh, also that our intentions, uh, were to, uh, infiltrate the panel and they took that directly from our promotional, uh, blurb for our fundraiser to get us to this, uh, uh, convention, right? Uh, which was a Swiftian satire basically saying that we've been spending decades, you know, perfecting our fake nerd personas through a love of, you know, everything geeky, just so that we, you know, at this particular moment, we'll make our move, infiltrate this convention and spread our totalitarian message that nerd culture is just fine as it is and should be left alone, right? And uh, so they took that to be a, a sincere statement of intention. That we were there, we were there to infiltrate and disrupt, and that's so not even remotely close to what actually happened. But anyhow, so the next morning we were already hearing on Twitter that we were kicked out before we even got to the convention. And when when we arrived at the convention, uh, they took Allison aside, told her to turn off her recording device, told her she was kicked out because there were twenty five or more accusations, complaints of harassment on uh, social media um, pertaining to her disruption of and harassment of people at the panel, <clears throat> and uh, which she had recorded, thankfully, and, uh, and that we were to pack up and leave. And they even had four Calgary police officers and two police vans on hand just in case we became violent when they kicked us out, which is like completely like if they actually had any idea who we are, um, they would have just, they would have realized we're okay. We're not wanted here. Okay, let's go. Um, and then a couple of days later, cause I mean, we had all of these fans who were, they, they made a point to, you know, travel, you know, seven hours in a car or even one of them 36 hours by bus to meet us at this convention. And, you know, this, the one guy, 36 hours on the bus and he's 10 hours into his trip and he's, you know, frantically emailing from some truck stop, um, you know, how, like what's going on, you know, what, what's happening. So we figured, you know, right away, um, the Friday, uh, we would have to arrange for some way for these people to be able to meet us who were traveling there specifically to meet us. And so we sort of arranged for and tweeted out on so all over social media that we were having a meetup at this time at Reader Rock Garden, which is right across from the Stampede Grounds, so very easy to find. And, uh, and you know, we'd be there to just hang out and talk and the whole bit, right? And on the Sunday, I guess the weather was so nice, we lingered too long for the comfort of the convention, and we sort of noticed there were five security officers standing directly across the street watching us. There are about 30 of us there. And uh, and then next thing we know, two police vans pull up and a cop gets out, demand, you know, he wants to know what we're doing here. And, uh, you know, we explained the situation and, and, you know, asked, you know, did you just, were you just driving by and noticed us? You're like, what's going on? Who called you? And he said security for the, like, the con convention staff or security had called to essentially warn, you know, they were concerned that we were going to storm the gates of the convention and make a big disruption and hold a big violent protest and the whole bit. Right. And, uh, I just kind of laughed and I was just like, that's so like, we're just here having a picnic. Like, look, we got pepperoni and cheese and, and a veggie tray. <laughs> Right. And, and we're taking group pictures and we're just having fun. Like, you know, and the cop was, he says, well, you guys actually sound like really nice people. And if you're planning on leaving soon, that's great. But frankly, you can stay as long as you want. It's a public park. Have a nice day. Enjoy the sun. And uh, so, I mean, it was just bizarre to us, right, that they would call the cops on us after doing that. 
And then when they finally, you know, because they had retweeted the Mary Sue article and uh, then they deleted the tweet and, uh, you know, they essentially came out saying that, yes, we'd, we'd uh, registered under fraudulent circumstances and then they deleted that. I mean, like there's, there was a whole lot of them tweeting stuff and then deleting it, the Calgary Expo. Yeah. And then finally they came out with this super vague statement that just said essentially... You know, we pride ourselves on uh, providing a safe and positive event for everyone. And we had reason to believe that this group didn't fit that mandate. And that's it. That's why we were kicked out. That's why Allison was banned for life is because they had reason to believe we're not safe and positive. I don't, I don't get it. In what way? What rule did we break? What policy did we violate? So. Were any of your, like, materials that you had in the the convention booth kind of did they do anything with them or like were, they, were you able to get all of your stuff out or I'm still not sure if um Hannah got her winter ended up getting her winter coat back um that got left behind in the rush they were really rushing us out the door um like we didn't just have a booth with some shelves right uh Allison had made this huge installation took five hours to set up it had scaffolding and then a backdrop that was attached to the scaffolding and then this podium with you know a cloth skin over it with stuff printed on it um images and then you know a uh, big gigantic tall led light display space cone thingy right so i mean like she had all of this stuff that all had to be disassembled and they only really gave us uh something like they wanted us out of there within half an hour after we arrived um because if attendees came in when the doors opened and found us disassembling our booth and getting kicked out it would look bad it would be embarrassing to them so it it was really rushed some of the equipment was damaged uh in being taken apart so quickly um and uh, yeah a few things were left behind i know hannah's uh, hannah wallen's coat got left behind and i'm not sure if she managed to get that back and uh yeah it was it was just a mad scramble to get out as quickly as possible and we still didn't get out before attendees had access to the the building so you know um, and i saw on the site that there's a, a legal fund where you guys are considering what to do next are you what's the is there a sort of plan to use those funds for you know to do or something um yeah well we're we're looking into our options and what the best uh you know because what the best area of law what the best venue to seek legal action or legal redress is um you know we're we're looking into um you know different precedents and human rights um legislation and human rights council decisions and uh also looking at uh you know contract law and things like that uh, i know that there's uh, they have sort of a get out of anything free clause um in their con the contract the boilerplate contract that all of the people who rent the booth sign um that essentially says we reserve the right to change the rules at any moment for no reason whatsoever and not give you any of your money back um but that that probably would never stand up in a court of law. Uh, it contravenes the Alberta Consumer Protection Act. So, um, so there there are various angles that we could approach this from, and we're speaking with some uh, legal representatives in order to figure out what the best way to go is. Mm -hmm. So, um, and going back to your blog, I was reading. I think one of the more recent posted in yeah from February. Um, there's something here you mentioned, sort of online dating, uh, you know, sort of disproving the notion. Um, you mentioned that it happens, sex doesn't come easier for men, even though, you know, people aren't getting married as much. Um, and you, you cite unreasonably high standards. Yeah. 80% <laughs> like or below average. What is that? Can you tell me more about what that? What that means. Oh, well, essentially, okay, Cupid, and they do a lot of research that's extremely helpful to people who are doing the online dating thing, help them thing, help them get success, right? Um, so they do all these algorithms and meta analyses and, and stuff like that. And what they found was that um, when they asked men to rate women, random women on the website, um, the bell curve looks normal, right? Just looks like a normal bell curve. 
when women are asked to uh, to judge the attractiveness, the level of attractiveness of men on the site, it's hugely lopsided. 80% of the men on that website are what these women would deem as less than average attractiveness. They're subpar, they're, they're, they're sub-average, right? Which is sort of mathematically not really reflective of a, a, a solid attachment with re- reality. Um, so essentially, uh, like w- women do have really high expectations, um, at least the women on OK Cupid, and uh, and what that means uh, generally, I think for men is that the top twenty percent of men, uh, when you have complete sexual freedom, um, you know that top 20% of men is going to be, I guess, scoring a lot, right? And the men who are not in the top 20%, um, as it gets, you know, to be sort of less and less and less attractive, um, as you go down, you know, into, you know, through the percentiles, um, you find that uh, most of the men, uh, even though men theoretically can have as much sex as they want outside of marriage, just like women can. Um, there's no moral edicts against it, but they, they are not going to be successful in actually doing that. Um, most of the women who are not looking for a commitment, but are just looking for casual sex are going to be going after that top 20% of men. And so the top 20% of men, they're like, they're just really enjoying themselves. Um, and, and the rest of the men are kind of left in the same situation that they were. They would have to make a commitment um, in order to to get regular access to, to sex, so. Well, it doesn't seem like a, like that, that doesn't sort of make me sympathize with the man who, who can't, you know, who outside of monogamy can't find a sexual partner. Like, I feel like they're, it doesn't, you know, I, I think that still having the sexual freedom for women is still way better, you know, as a whole than if they just aren't choosing this 80% of men. You know what I mean? Like, there's, just because one group gets to have more choice doesn't mean that, you know, if you're not being chosen, that it's, a, you know, it's bad and that's you know, let's take that choice away so that... Well, I would, I would actually have the same... That, that's the same attitude that I have toward women in STEM fields, right? Just because, you know, only 10% of the people in, in engineering are women doesn't mean that any injustice is necessarily being done, and it doesn't mean that engineering has to change in some way to make women want to be there more. Um, you know, but at the same time, you can't really... Like, this is this is... It's not so much an argument that this situation needs to change, mm-hmm. right? It's an argument that when feminists say the sexual revolution helps men too, right? Um, yeah, it only helps a certain subset of men, right? And the rest of the men are stuck just where they were before the sexual revolution. Well, it also, outside of the actual sex and the sexual revolution, I think it helps men in the sense that you know, birth control is acceptable to women, and if you're also not ready to have a kid, that you won't be having a kid if you can make that choice together um, and, you know, use contraceptives or use birth control. Like, they're much more accessible than they were, you know, decades and decades ago. Well, that's um, that's certainly true, but that's not always the case, and I think that that's sort of something that you have to be really careful about uh, telling men you know, the pill helps you too, or abortion helps you too. Well, yes and no, um, because the pill is actually what facilitates uh, a woman's ability to essentially get pregnant against a man's wishes. Um, you know, it, it, if a man, if, if there was no birth control pill, he'd be using a condom, mm-hmm. right? But because she says, oh, don't worry about it, I'm on the pill, Right. Um, that facilitates the small, and it's probably not huge, but the small subset of women who are willing to do that. And I know women personally who have done that. I know one woman who did it four times to her own husband. 
Right. He said, I don't want kids. And she said, okay, honey, we can't afford them. I know. And then three months later, she's pregnant. Oh, it must have been the antibiotics or, oh, I don't know how that happened. Right. Meanwhile, she's telling her sister, oh, yeah, I totally just went off the pill. Hmm. Right. I guess, I mean, I'm sure that is a very small, like you said, a small subset of women. But I, in that case, if they've had four kids, sort of the, my, my instinct would be, well, maybe I should, maybe we should have a more open conversation about what kind of birth control methods we're using and maybe we should change it or maybe I should just start wearing condoms just in case kind of thing. So. After, after the third kid, he told her he wanted to have a vasectomy and she said if he did, she would divorce him. And as a woman who hasn't had a job through the whole marriage, you can be guaranteed that he'd be paying through the nose in a divorce as the sole breadwinner, and they have three kids. So, you know, and she's got a high school education. So, I mean, it's, you know, you have you have a man here who's sort of, like, trapped, even if he suspects that she's been lying to him and and getting pregnant on purpose against his wishes and having you know, kids that he can't afford to support. Um, it, it's, I mean, it sounds callous, but uh, there is a reason why the saying exists. It's cheaper to keep her. Mm. Right? So, I mean, he's looking down two really ugly options here, and he's going, they both suck. Right? Mm. So, I mean, you, you kind of look at that, and... This whole idea that um, a birth control option that w that is entirely in the hands of women, whether it is the pill or whether it is abortion, right? Where the man actually, I mean, the man has no right to to double check and ensure that you're on the pill. That's that's your medical history. He can't phone your doctor and say, you know, does she s still have an IUD, right? right. right? Um, right. And he he doesn't have any uh, say legal say in the decision to abort a child or to keep a baby right um to to say that this is liberating for men i don't think that if we eliminated all the birth control choices for women and uh you know say we made them all illegal and all there was was condoms and and that vasil gel that's coming up that will you know make yeah. render men temporarily sterile for up to 10 years if all the, if that's all there was women would feel so terrified of sex they would you know they like they wouldn't stand for it they would be just like we're supposed to be at the mercy of the word of this man right that he has had a vasectomy you know it shouldn't of course like it shouldn't just be a one-way street mm. way but it, you know there, there are condoms <laughs> like if the man is really worried he can wear a condom and if the woman is really worried she can I, tell him to wear a condom and that's like i i think that's an un, i think that's an uncomfortable um discussion to have with your wife who's reassured you over and over that she's on the pill and you don't have to worry about it um kind of like that uh that awkward conversation when a man says you know I, i'd really like to have the baby dna tested i i i don't think that that's that's a conversation most men are going to want to have uh, with right. with their wives. Um, and uh, those kinds of things would be completely eliminated uh, once there are birth control options for men that are 100% in their control. Um, and also if and when DNA testing becomes routine at birth. Mm -hmm. Right. And some people in the MRM, in the men's rights movement, are, are advo advocating for that, to eliminate paternity fraud as, as um, you know, a thing. So. Um, and I just had one line here that I had underlined uh, in the same post, just comes right after that graph on, uh, you're right, being a slut is so easy and being a stud is so about as difficult as it ever was. Uh, can you tell me about sort of that language choice? Because just on just on the surface reading of my first impression was that was what a very like connotation heavy sort of uh, negative term for uh, for doing the same action that a stud, which has a very positive connotation, would be doing. Well, the whole the whole reason why, and I don't think that there's ever like 
there's never been a period in time uh, when male promiscuity was endorsed by the culture, just in this kind of blanket sense that, you know, men are free to go out and have sex with wh- however many women they want, and no worries, right? Um, the reason why it was sometimes admired, a uh, man's ability to seduce women, is because it's hard. It's difficult. Um, and... For women, I mean, I could go up to five random guys, even as a 44-year-old woman with short hair and comfortable shoes, I could go up to five random guys in a bar and I could probably take one of them home. Just saying, just saying, hey, you want to go have sex? Um, you know, it, it's it's not hard to get laid as a woman. It's, it's just not. Um, not if you're willing to, uh, you know, maybe not aim for that top 20%, but, you know, it, like getting sex for a woman is, is not hard getting access to the particular men that you might feel you deserve might be more difficult. But for a lot of men, uh, getting sex in general um, is is extremely difficult. And uh, so as long as that dichotomy exists, um, where it's very easy, and I, I essentially borrowed that sort of turn of phrase from Jim Jeffries, Right. Where he said, you know, he said, you know, being a slut to to be a stud, you have to do this, that and the other thing, be groomed, you know, well groomed, well dressed and, you know, have a car and a fake job. Right. To be a slut, you just have to be there. Right. Um, And and then he went on to say language sort of mean that, you know, (coughs) but if the woman is doing it, that is a bad thing. Whereas if the guy can do it and he accomplishes that and he goes over all these hurdles that you mentioned that it's a good thing so it's still setting it up as like the what? woman does it it's bad but if the guy can manage to do it like good on him well, yeah. Well, I think if if you look at the sort of the, go all the way down through all the layers of of that double standard, right? You'll find that uh, part of the reason uh, for it is that female sexuality is considered to be highly valuable. Um, it's one of the reasons why we only care about it when women are raped and when men are raped by women, we just high five them and say, "You should feel lucky. You got some." Um, so, you know. It, if you look at the, even the terminology, like a soiled woman, right, from ages ago, right? Well, what did she become soiled by? By coming into contact with male sexuality, right? So whose sexuality do we see as dirty? And it's the difference, essentially, the difference between what we would call a slut and what we would call a stud, but sometimes we call uh, those men dogs or players or or, you know, uh, whatever, they, you know, more derogatory terms. The, the difference essentially amounts to uh, a woman who behaves in that way is seen as damaging herself, right, and her, her sexual value, right? And a man who behaves in that way is seen as damaging his partners. Like damaging his what? His partners. Oh, his partners. He's not damaging himself. He's damaging his partners. He's... He's, you know, he's taking advantage of these women. He's, you know, you look at even just the rhetoric in mainstream culture around the pickup artist community. Um, they're taking advantage of them. You know, they're treating women like trash, blah, blah, blah. Well, all they're doing is convincing women to have sex with them. I mean, if convincing a woman to have sex with you um, is treating her like trash, like, what does that say about your attitude toward male and female sexuality, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, you know, like, some of these stereotypes exist, I think, for biological reasons, but some of them are, are totally overblown in the culture. And I think that, you know, I, I was a highly promiscuous young woman before I got married, and I was one of the uh, rare ones who, who never got called a slut ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't hide it. I... I I totally didn't, but part of why I think I got away with that was because I, I, it wasn't accompanied by a whole host of other behaviors, attention-seeking behaviors that a lot of, uh, of women who are promiscuous engage in, like, you know, dressing, you know, in a, in a very sexual way, dressing very provocatively, uh, really seeking male attention and male validation and all of those. I just liked sex. Um, 
and that was that was why I I did that. Um, so, you know, you you sort of look at um, some of those attitudes, and I mean, if we got rid of that whole slut stud dichotomy, and we saw female sexuality as exactly identical to male sexuality, right? In how we have our attitude toward it. Would would you support high-fiving a woman that gets raped? Because, hey, you got some, right? Well, I don't think, I mean, you know, I wouldn't... I, I know if you... If a guy told me he had been raped, I wouldn't high-five him. Yeah, I, I know, well, but I mean... Awesome. This is, this is a common attitude in the culture, right? We care. We, we're we horrified when women get raped, in part because of all the same things that cause that slut-stud dichotomy. Mm. So, um, you know, if, if we actually really caused a, a shift, a, a deep shift in cultural attitudes towards women's sexuality, we would actually have to stop treating rape like it's this super horrific, super uniquely horrible, heinous crime. Um, in my opinion, it's not. Uh, but I I don't think, you know, it's not uniquely heinous. It's, there are a hundred, I could name a hundred things that I would rather be raped than. I would rather be raped than get cancer and die before my 12-year-old graduates high school. Um you know, I would rather be raped than than spend five years getting tortured in Gitmo. I would I would rather be raped than you know see one of my children murdered. Um, you well, know, I, to, I mean, I think rape is super super horrible, and I my first instinct is to say, or you know, sort of play quote quote unquote devil's advocate here and say, that, you know, if if a, a rape survivor were here, she might say in return, like, well, it's easy to say if a person hasn't been raped. Oh, I'm, I've been close, but, you know, mm-hmm. we'll look at it this way, right? If you were the mother of a child mm-hmm. and someone broke into your house and he said, if you don't be quiet and do everything I say, I'm going to kill your child. Mm-hmm. What would you do? Then, I'm, you know, I'd be quiet and... You would, you would you, choose you the lesser of the two evils. You're out of way to get out. Yeah, you would choose the lesser of the two evils, though. Um, you would absolutely, like, I, I think almost any mother would, any mother would um, sacrifice her sexual autonomy for a brief period of time if she thought it would save the life of her child, right? So that's automatically sure, a value I just, judgment. I just, I just think that it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other, that it is still this super horrible... Yes, I agree. ...changing... I agree. I absolutely agree. But the way the way the rhetoric is, um, you know, uh, it's it's almost like it's in a class by itself. We can talk about genocides um, with uh, talk, discussion of genocide is less of a minefield than discussing rape. You know, discussing, you know, murder is less of a minefield than discussing rape. Um you know, child abuse, all kinds of, of really horrible, horrific things, we feel more comfortable discussing them than discussing rape because the the reaction um, from people when you put your foot a little bit wrong or you say something that might be construed as insensitive about rape, particularly the rape of women, um, the reaction is just absolutely, um, particularly now that social media is such a huge thing. Um, yeah. And facilitates this sort of mob dogpile type behavior. Um, it, it can be well, absolutely there, atrocious. You know, that's different. You know, I I do believe that there is a thing such as rape culture, and I know that not not everyone does. But I think the difference in there is is that no one's saying, um, you know, well he was really asking for it when he got shot in the head. Or like, are you kidding? This entire this entire group of people were really asking for it when genocide happened. Like. But there, but there, people will come out and say like, oh, but here's the she thing. Was really drunk, so she was sort of asking for it. Or Here, she had he, on a short skirt. So what did she expect? Okay, but but the Nazis would have said the Jews were asking for it, right? And <laughs> right, but like, no, I mean, I mean, no one on on the right. Well, it's no one on the outside of the event. If if you actually look at the Steubenville thing, right? 
you, 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 there, there's so many dynamics at play there, right? That, um, what you essentially had was you had a small economically depressed community where a third of the houses are standing empty because everybody's left, right? And all the town has to be proud of is high school football. Essentially. I mean, high school football is a major thing. It's a major deal there. And you have these football stars and they do something atrocious. Mm-hmm. And they do something atrocious to somebody who isn't even from Steubenville. She's an outsider. Mm-hmm. Right? So now you have this entire community that is like, well, these are our boys. And she's an outsider. And look how drunk she was. And blah, blah, blah. And they're they're making excuses because it's hero worship and it's tribalism and it's it's, mm-hmm. you know their claim to fame and pride and you know it's their community what the community cohesion is being threatened by this incident right and so they cover it up and you know and nobody covered up they know it's serious right because nobody you know lied and and you know burned documents and engaged in a massive cover-up because some high school footballer stole a chocolate bar from the 7-eleven no they knew that something that this is a big deal this is a big freaking deal and that's why they covered it up. And, you know, and then, okay, then when the story broke outside of the area, right? And all of the people who have no skin in the game, they got no, they, they don't, they never heard of Steubenville High School football or, or, you know, never heard of Steubenville at all, right? But they all looked at what went on. Everybody was outraged because they weren't in the midst of it, right? Now, you can say that the reaction of, of so many people in that community um, who were immersed in all of these different psychological group psychology dynamics, you know, based around cronyism and, and uh, tribalism and, and community cohesion and, and let's just bury this because, you know, these are our heroes, right? Um, You can say that that's rape culture, and I suppose maybe that's like a little tiny microcosm of rape culture, but anybody who was outside of those forces, those social forces, looked on that. Almost all the people who looked on that, they went, oh my god, this is like horrible, right? Like, what the fuck is going on in Steubenville, right? And so, I mean... Essentially, I don't think that there's this huge society-wide uh, rape culture. I think that there are so many other things at play, and there are so many incidences of victim blaming. Well, Trayvon Martin had it coming because look how he behaved, and Michael Brown had it coming because look how he behaved, right? And and all of these, you know, uh, if if Eric Garner didn't want to, you know, die of an asthma attack, you know, then he shouldn't have resisted arrest. And, you know, so you have all kinds of rhetoric around um, the idea that certain people, when bad things happen to them, have it coming. They asked for it, right? It's not just about rape, right? People make those kinds of judgments about all kinds of crimes, right? And often they make judgments about those kinds of crimes, even when it isn't a black person who got killed by police, even when it's a white person who got killed by police, or even if it's, you know, somebody who left their house unlocked, like my boyfriend's constantly reminding me to lock the damn door, right? And, and do you, can you imagine a reality after he's reminded me to lock the door, you know, 10 times this week, if somebody breaks in and steals a bunch of stuff that he's not going to say, why the fuck didn't you lock the door? What were you thinking? So, you know, essentially like all of these things happen across a wide variety and of, of, and just because somebody would say, well, why didn't you lock your door? doesn't mean we live in a burglary culture right. or a culture you, of victim you blaming. You might hesitate to report the burglary, whereas you might hesitate to report a rape or sexual assault that happened to you because for fear that you won't be believed or that you'll be blamed or, you know, oh, the you reason the door unlocked, you would still call the police and say, hey, my TV is missing, you know, so the door might have been unlocked, but... My TV's still missing, you know what I mean? The reason why I didn't report my own sexual assault was in part because I didn't want my dad to go to prison. 
and if I'd reported the sexual assault, my dad might have ended up in prison for something that he would have done in the heat of the moment to the two boys who did that to me. Mm-hmm. Right? And I was pretty sure that that would have been a reaction that he would have had. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's not always about fear of being believed. In fact, um, they've done more recent studies than the ones that typically get used and they've found that um fear of being uh not being believed is way down low on the list um a lot of people don't want their family to know um a lot of people just want to get on with their life um they don't they don't want the to go through the process um even if you make the process easier they wouldn't want to go through it um you know, a lot of, a lot of people come out of it and they feel okay. You know, so you look at the, the reasons why women don't report these days, and I can get you some of the data on that if you want to, Oh, that would be great. Yeah. if you want to look at it. Um, but, but a lot of the reasons that they report, choose not to report now are very different from the reasons that they chose not to report 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, Regardless of how, you know, we've had 40 years of amending uh, the law, the legislation and procedure and investigative procedure and um, rules of admissibility for evidence and things like that. And it hasn't really affected report rates that much. So, you know, essentially now... Um, unlike 30 years ago, now you have the right to bring an advocate with you, even, you know, maybe a professional counselor or even just a friend and and bring an advocate with you when you report, you have a right to, uh, to, uh, not be, uh, directly cross-examined on your sexual history. Um, you have a right to all kinds of, of, uh, exemptions and, and things like that. Um, you have a right to get a rape kit done without reporting to police now in the U.S. It, it used to be that uh, if you went to the hospital and got a rape kit done, uh, they would call police. Um, but now, uh, if you, and this is the same, if, if you've been shot, right? Doesn't matter how much you say you just had an accident cleaning your gun, right? If there's any suspicion that a felony might have occurred, they are responsible. They have to notify police, right? Right. If you go into a, a hospital and say a felony has occurred, right? I've been raped and I need a rape kit. They aren't allowed to call the police now. They, they need your. They the are not allowed to call the police now. They need your permission to do that. Oh, I see. Right. So we're treating it completely different from any other serious crime, mm-hmm. and at the same time, report rates haven't really changed. So, I mean, like, I'm, I'm not sure how much further we can, we can go. I suppose we could make it so that a, a woman just has to name a guy and he goes to prison and maybe that'd help, but, but, uh, I don't see that as remotely fair. So. Yeah. Um, I just realized how much of my time, how much of your time I've taken up. <laughs> I feel like I should probably let you go soon, but, um, further down the line, I'd like to reporting. Is it okay if we just stay in touch if I have any more questions or or anything. Oh, sure, yeah, not a problem. I can talk a little bit more if you have time, but you sound like oh, you're cool. busy, too. Sure. Um, well, I, I should grab probably some basics from you, um, like age, location, that kind of stuff, if that's okay. I'm okay. Cool with that. Oh, yeah, no problem. I'm in Edmonton, Alberta. <laughs> um, we actually just got five inches of snow. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. Hey. No, it, oh, here's the thing. We had an election, an Alberta election last night. And the NDP, which would be sort of like your Ralph Nader party, mm-hmm. essentially, the NDP won a majority in Alberta, which has had a PC, it's had a conservative government for 44 years or something like that. <laughs> okay. They took, and they did, the NDP took a majority in Alberta, right? And then the very next morning, hell froze over. So, yeah, it was it was quite amusing to wake up to that. Um, okay, and I am 44 years old. 44, okay. Um, and do you consider the blog at all to sort of be, to be kind of a full-time job or a job 
at all. I saw that there's a, um, you know, one of those donate here buttons on the site. So is that, is that a source of income for you or? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, um, it's, it's definitely, uh, I, I only have to work maybe, uh, two evening shifts a week to maintain my contribution to the household expenses. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's actually, it's, it's, I wouldn't call it good money. Um, but then, you know, I was, I was the person who was raising a family of five on under $25,000 a year for about 10 years. So, um, you know, good money to me is, you know, you get to eat pizza once a month. So, you know, take out pizza. So not, uh, not for you. What, what do you do? You mentioned the two shifts a week. Oh, I, I just wait tables. So, okay. you know, um, I, I don't have a formal education. That's probably, uh, one of my weaknesses and one of my strengths. Um, I know a lot of people with, uh, letters after their names. I actually have a, a fair, <laughs> have had a fair number of professors message me and, uh, and say, the moment I get tenure, I'll stop, I'll start talking about these issues. But, yeah. you know, as long as I can, I'm glad you're here, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, it, it doesn't seem to, uh, to matter too much as far as my ability to do this, but I suppose having some letters after my name might, um, help me be taken seriously in certain areas of, you know, media and, and things like that. But. And how does this sort of fit into, um, you know, your quote, like your bio, your autobiography, so to speak, like, were you, were you always interested in these issues and writing and they the two just sort of came together or were you feminist at some point and then decided to, to sort of change your viewpoint how does it kind of oh I was I was sort of fit in? I was never a feminist um mm -hmm. the feminism like it, it it never uh never coincided with what I observed of what's actually going on just as a as a person going around the world and watching human interaction and stuff. It just never seemed to be a good fit. So, um, I was never a feminist and, and, uh, essentially it was, it was stumbling on, I was, I was writing erotica for maybe three, four years, you know, had some books published and, and, uh, was part of a wider, uh, community of romance and, and erotic authors. And, uh, and that was sort of when I stumbled onto the men's men's issues websites and stuff like that. So, I mean, it was, uh, I've always written. Um, I've been writing since I was 15 and, uh, and just various things. I mean, like my books, the, and no, I'm not going to tell you my pen name because I haven't told anybody, but um, one, I, they were actually reviewed by feminists, uh, and uh, were often called uh, subversive and empowering and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've always sort of had this, um, you know, same with the Legos when I was a little kid and things like that, right? right. Just sort of a subversive attitude about gender. And and uh, so, yeah, it was, it was just always an interest. And uh, I guess it didn't get formalized until I started discussing it very very actively got really really interested in the sort of the group psychology behind it the you know the sociology behind it all of that um behind how we think and feel about gender and uh and the evolutionary psychology behind it and uh and yeah it just it just piqued my interest and and i just and then once once you see a need like i said once you have somebody writing to you saying you're the reason i didn't kill myself um you sort of feel the responsibility to keep, keep Yeah, you kind of do. I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, like, if, if there's this huge void out there, um, somebody's got to fill it. And for now, for that that's me, for whatever reason, and maybe someone will come along in a little while and take it off my hands, and I'll be able to concentrate on installing a toilet in my upstairs bathroom. <laughs> but um, But not today. Oh, okay. that no, that would be fine. That would be absolutely oh. Can uh, like what? What is the like sort of the the working title of the story that you're doing? Um, I actually just the the working title 
know right now on our secret sport is together. No, still sort of in the beginning of trying to figure out, you know, what 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 are the what is the movement? What are the tenets of the movement? Who are the women that are involved? That it just it just sort of piqued my interest. The idea of you know women in a men's rights movement. Does that sort of play on words? Kind of yeah was enough to to pique my interest. So oh, there you still, go. Still in the very early stages, trying to figure it all out. All right. Well, I'm I'm I hope I've been helpful and uh I don't know if you've talked to Allison yet, but um Not yet. She did reach out over email. I think um I emailed her trying to put up the time, but have to follow up with her. Yeah, no, she'll be an interesting person to talk with. I think you'll be able to tell just from talking with her she's much more calm and circumspect than I am. And yeah. uh and her tongue is not quite so salty cuz <laughs> I swear a lot. It's bad habit but well, well thanks again um i'm sure i'll be in touch but i appreciate appreciate all the time i've taken away from you today <laughs> all right thank you so much and and uh, i look forward to reading the story all right thanks, okay bye-bye